Thank you all for joining us. My name is Miriam Kadosh, and welcome to the Melanoma Research Foundation's Ask the Expert webinar series. Again, my name is Miriam. I'm Director of Education and Patient Engagement here at the Melanoma Research Foundation. We are pleased to have you join us for today's wonderful educational opportunity entitled Current Treatments and the Future of Research for Mucosal Melanoma. The goal today is to educate patients and the community about mucosal melanoma, today's treatments, and what is the latest in research. Tonight we have two experts and actually three experts as we have a patient who joined us as well to give us the patient perspective. Um, and make sure you stick around for the end for our question and answer section. Our mission at the MRF is to eradicate melanoma by accelerating research while educating to and advocating for the melanoma community. We know that education is critical for patients to make informed decisions about their care. And we are grateful to Alchemies for their generous support of this webinar series and investment in the MRF's mission. A bit of housekeeping before we get started. We encourage you to use the Q&A box to ask questions throughout the session. The information presented during today's session is for educational purposes and any individual treatment questions should be directed to your healthcare provider. We encourage everyone to visit melanoma.org to learn more about resources that we have available. And tonight's session will be available for viewing later as part of our videos on demand library that you can share with others. Okay, we're gonna get started with our first speaker and I will introduce him. And then I will introduce our next speaker um, at the end of our first presentation. So first we will hear from Dr. Shahir Khan. Dr. Khan is a medical oncologist at Northwell Health Cancer Institute. He specializes in the management of cutaneous malignancies, including uveal and mucosal melanomas. He is actively involved in developing early phase clinical trials with, our, with a particular focus on rare malignancies. Dr. Khan, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Well, thanks so much um, for introducing me, Miriam, and for having me. Um, give me one second. I'm just going to um, share my slides. Okay. I think those should Great. be projecting. Okay. So, yep. yeah. So, um, yeah, again, thanks for having me. And, um, yeah, so in the next 15 minutes or so, what I'd like to do is kind of just give a brief introduction into, um, you know, mucosal melanoma generally, and then also uh, talk a bit about um, kind of the current treatments that we have, uh, the data that we have for them. Um, and then I'll be passing it on to uh, Dr. Shastari, who will be uh, talking about some of the ongoing uh, research that's being done and the new therapies that we're looking at. Um, and then we'll be uh, followed by our patient perspective and, and some Q&A. So, um, you know, uh, we know that uh, melanomas are, are very common overall, um, but they really don't encompass one disease. There are um, several kind of what we call subtypes of melanoma that can behave very differently. And so the most common, you know, type of melanoma that we think of is cutaneous melanoma, um, particularly melanoma in non-sun damaged skin. But we know that there are these various subtypes, including acral melanoma, uveal melanoma, and mucosal melanoma. Um, as a total burden of people who are diagnosed with this type of cancer, mucosal melanoma represents a relatively small fraction, um, thankfully, but also um, that leads to certain challenges, which we'll talk about. Um, so one of the one of the particularities of this um, type of melanoma um, is that it, it uh, presents in various locations within the body. It's not just one area. Um, it's not just one organ system. The most common um, area that initially presents is in the head and neck region. So that can be either in the oral cavity or within the nasal or sinus um, sinuses. Um, and this also impacts um, how these tumors uh, present, what symptoms they cause, um, and then how they're diagnosed. And so, you know, depending on the exact location 
Um, uh, there might be a visual sign of this tumor developing. There might be some symptoms such as obstruction that might develop. Uh, there can be things like bleeding as well. Um, uh, but there's a kind of whole host of symptoms that might be caused by tumors in this head and neck area. Um, when we contrast that with the second most common area, which is the anal rectal region, um, you know, typically the, the most common symptom that people will see is bleeding. And oftentimes these can even be misdiagnosed as hemorrhoids because of the kind of typical symptoms of bleeding and pain with, with bowel movements and how common hemorrhoids are in comparison to something relatively rare like mucosal melanoma. And then um, finally, vulvovaginal mucosal melanomas, which um, uh, present most commonly on the outer surface or the vulva um, and can be associated with bleeding and irritation. Um, you know, in addition to the differences in where these tumors are presenting um, and the pattern and the symptoms that they cause, we also know that mucosal melanomas are different on a genetic basis. Um, and so, you know, over the last few years, we've been able to characterize uh, the types of mutations that are seen in different types of melanoma. In skin melanoma, we know that a significant proportion of tumors will have a mutation in something called BRAF. Um, and BRAF has been able, there have been therapies that have been able to be developed that target this, um, this pathway that is mutated. Um, uh, in other melanoma subtypes, including mucosal melanoma, we can see that there's uh, not nearly as high a rate of BRAF mutations and that there's a significantly more variance in the types of mutations that we see. So there are a small proportion of patients' um, tumors that have BRAF mutations, um, but there are other mutations like this NRAS mutation, like this CKIT mutation, which are also commonly seen. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have the same types of targeted therapies towards these mutations that we have for BRAF uh, mutant skin melanomas. Um, in addition to these, what we call driver mutations, we know that um, these uh, mucosal melanomas are also different um, by virtue of the total burden of mutations that we see. So in skin melanoma, as we can see in this figure, the total um, mutations um, that we see are significantly higher as compared to the other melanoma subtypes, including mucosal melanoma. And we also see that um, there's this difference in what we call structural variants. And so the kind of total uh, function and structure of the chromosomes within the cells appears to be more unstable in mucosal melanoma. And we think all of these um, factors um, weigh into how these tumors behave and the differences in which they behave overall. Um, so in this slide, I kind of just wanted to illustrate, um, again, the variance that we see in terms of how these tumors present and how uh, the, the pathways that patients then follow as they go through initial assessment, diagnosis, and then management. Um, and so, you know, if a tumor presents in the oral cavity or the nasal passages, um, you know, the first person who might evaluate these, um, these findings would be somebody, you know, including a dentist, often, you know, at a routine check. Um, and then that prompts, you know, further evaluation, oftentimes by a head and neck surgeon, um, contrasting with somebody with a tumor that presents in the anal rectal region in which um, a GI doctor or a colorectal surgeon might be the first one to evaluate and then eventually diagnose. And then obviously in the vulvovaginal area, our OBGYN colleagues are going to be the first kind of line there. Um, and then the way that these tumors are then managed, um, oftentimes surgically whenever possible, um, is also dictated by the site. And so um, uh, head and neck surgeons are going to take the lead in the head and neck area, our surgical oncolog oncologists or colorectal surgeons would be taking the lead in the anal rectal area. And then um, gynecologic surgeons would be um, doing the same for vulvovaginal. For all of these sites, you know, radiation is sometimes used and um, can be used if surgery is not an option or in conjunction with surgery. Um, uh, but 
Um, uh, all this is to show that, you know, there's not one set of doctors who are going to be initially evaluating, initially managing uh, these tumors. And that can lead to some of the difficulty that we have in kind of standardizing the initial management. One of the other um, barriers um, is, is also that you know, in, in oncology, the way that we kind of assess tumors initially is by staging them. And, you know, we have these very detailed criteria that have been developed by, you know, large um, groups of, of experts. Um, the most common one is something called the AJCC. Um, and although we do have dedicated um, staging criteria for mucosal melanoma in the head and neck, we don't have the same criteria for mucosal melanomas that present in other parts of the body. And so in those situations, whether it's surgeons or other doctors, you know, then they have to try to rely on other criteria, whether it's adapting the criteria for cutaneous melanoma, whether it's using their own surgical criteria that they have for other tumors or other diseases. Um, so that also leads to a challenge in kind of standardizing um, not just how to initially manage um, these tumors, but also in terms of predicting, well, what is the risk of these coming back if they are able to be removed surgically? So just as an example here, we can see the, the kind of criteria that we use for um, head and neck tumors. Um, and so depending on the depth of the tumor, which areas it's involving in the, in the head and neck mucosa, um, whether it's involving any deeper tissues, whether it's involving lymph nodes, and then obviously if it's involving any other organ in the body, that then dictates what stage the tumor is and then what stage we consider uh, the person's cancer to be overall. Um, and that then impacts what kind of therapies we would potentially be able to offer. Um, so um, as I've as I've mentioned, um, you know, when a tumor is initially evaluated, the objective in almost all cancers is to try to surgically remove it um, to achieve a cure by removing all of the cancer cells that are present, um, and then hopefully preventing any additional growth. Um, we know that um, with mucosal melanomas and other tumors, sometimes despite our best efforts, despite the surgeon's best efforts there will be cells that are left over that will then subsequently grow if we don't do anything. Um, and so there, uh, that's where our role as medical oncologists comes in. We give therapies to try to treat tumors that, have, um, that are unable to be removed surgically, that have spread to other locations. And also we, try, we give therapy to try to prevent cancers from coming back. Um, and so in skin melanoma, we know that immunotherapy is really the, the standard um, to try to reduce the risk of these melanomas coming back. And there have been large studies, including this study, which was a Checkmate 238 study that was published several years ago that showed that nivolumab, one of the common immunotherapy drugs that we use, um, improved the, uh, the chance of people living without a recurrence. Um, however, as we can see when we kind of dive into the details here, um, you know, only a very small number of the patients that were on this trial had mucosal melanoma. And so, of course, that very much limits what inference we can take from this data. Um, and, uh, and so as a result, um, you know, we really don't have a clear understanding of what the benefit is of using immunotherapy the same way that we use in skin melanoma. Um, uh, so one other type of therapy that we use very commonly in oncology is, is chemotherapy. Um, we don't use it so much in skin melanoma because um, uh, immunotherapy has been shown to be much more effective. Um, but um, in other places in the world, um, it is used quite commonly. And, and one place in particular is China, where mucosal melanomas actually represent a significantly higher proportion of total melanomas. Um, and so as a result, they've also been able to do some um, additional large studies looking at different therapies, including chemotherapy. Um, and um, what our colleagues in China were able to show was that when they gave chemotherapy to patients after they had had surgery, um, it appeared to have a significant improvement um, in the chances that the melanoma came, comes back and in terms of how long people were living overall. 
The challenge with um, uh, chemotherapy is that, um, and, and the data from these uh, trials in China is that, you know, we know that there's a difference um, in uh, the overall presentation of melanomas there, where there's a significantly higher proportion of melanomas. And we know that there are differences, um, genetic differences in people across ethnicities. And so we don't know if this same benefit would be seen in non-Chinese populations. And unfortunately, we don't have the capacity to do these same large trials that, that have been done by our Chinese colleagues. So what about um, uh, tumors that are not able to be treated surgically or that have spread to other locations in the body? Again, we are limited by the fact that we don't have many dedicated clinical trials specifically for uveal melanoma. But what um, uh, what what people have done, including Dr. Shastari, have have done is they've looked at all of the patients who've received um, immunotherapy in different clinical trials, and then taken out the patients with mucosal melanoma to see well how do they do. Um, and what, what they've shown is that although people don't have, uh, um, uh, mucosal melanomas don't tend to have as good response as skin melanoma, immunotherapy does appear to help a significant proportion of people. And particularly looking at the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab, that appears to have the most activity. And that's been shown um, initially in 2017, um, and then again by Dr. Shastari and his colleagues in 2020, which was presented at one of our national conferences, which showed that um, the combination again of nivolumab and ipilimumab appeared to have a both deeper and more um, durable effect. And that's what's shown in this next figure, where we can see that there's a significant proportion of patients who going out years um, uh, did not have progression of their cancer and were living um, and, and and alive, you know, going going past 60 months. And so there is a significant proportion of people whose tumors will respond and will then have durable control of their disease as well. And so again, although this data is limited by the fact that these are not dedicated trials for mucosal melanoma, um, this uh, cumulative experience that's been collected does appear to show significant activity for these drugs. Um, there are other combinations that are being studied, and, and Dr. Shastari will touch on this as well. Um, one of these combinations is looking at um, a type of therapy that we call um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors or TKIs, and particularly ones looking at a specific pathway called a VEGF. Um, and axitinib is one of these drugs that's in the VEGF inhibitor. Um, and again, our colleagues in China have put together a clinical trial and, and published the results where they combined axitinib plus toripalumab, which is another immunotherapy drug. And they found that almost 50% of patients who received this therapy had a response. This is even more notable because um, again, there's some variances in, in how um, uh, tumors and uh, cancers present in different populations. When they've previously looked at immunotherapy alone in these Chinese patients, it did not appear to be very effective. But with this combination, there does appear to be significant synergy that resulted in significant activity. Um, and so this was a phase 1B clinical trial. It was only 29 patients. Um, but now we're going to be studying um, this further in various settings to see if this combination might be more uh, might be uh, more effective in a, in a larger group as well. And then again in China, they've they've also looked at um, again the combination of chemotherapy, which they initially demonstrated appeared to decrease the likelihood that people's cancer might come back. And then they added another um, VEGF targeting therapy, this time an antibody. Um, and that appeared to result in improved outcomes again, just compared to chemotherapy alone. Um, once again, you know, there might be some variance in terms of how, pe how people's tumors may respond depending on their ethnicity, but this again appeared to show that there was some synergy with uh, VEGF targeting um, with both chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Um, and then the final slide I have is just talking about one of our targeted therapies called imatinib. And so 
Um, I mentioned in the beginning that one mutation that we see relatively commonly in mucosal melanoma is something called CKIT. And so um, various groups have then looked at certain drugs that block this CKIT pathway. And they've shown that although there is some, um, there is there are some people whose tumors appear to shrink, appear to respond, overall, the efficacy is not where we want it to be. Um, and the kind of time um, until the tumors start growing again is actually fairly limited. And so, you know, as compared to some of the target therapies that we have in other diseases and in cutaneous melanoma, this isn't kind of the bar that we want it to be. Um, and so although this is an option, um, and this is something that we may use in people whose tumors have this mutation, um, we, we, do, we do look for something that's more effective, and that's part of um, our ongoing efforts in terms of research. Um, and so uh, just to wrap up my part of this talk, um, you know, some take-home points. Um, mucosal melanoma, as, as you know, we all know, is a unique subtype of melanoma. Um, depending on the site of uh, the tumor, you know, patients' journeys can be quite distinct um, and involve different um, disciplines and team members. Um, part of the challenge is that diversity, but also um, some of the variants that we have in staging and kind of risk stratification. When we look at people's whose people whose tumors have been surgically removed, we don't have clear data supporting the use of um, immunotherapy. We do have trials that have shown benefit with chemotherapy, but that might be a unique population. Um, in people whose tumors can't be surgically removed or whose tumors recur um, and go to other locations in the body. Um, you know, we have several therapies that we use in a standard manner, including um, the most, uh, what appears to be the most effective, which is combination immunotherapy. Uh, we can also use targeted therapies if, if the, there, there are certain mutations. Um, and then we can consider the use of certain chemotherapy regimens as well, um, uh, based on that uh, data from China. Um, uh, but overall, um, you know, there's there's clearly a significant need to improve um, our systemic therapies, our management, um, and you know, this is an area of of uh, significant effort, um, including what uh, Dr. Tristari will be talking about going forward. Um, so, with that, I'll I'll turn it over to you, um, and uh, and I'll be uh, here for questions after. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan. I already see some questions coming in through the chat, so we'll definitely be ready to answer those and some, some uh, very great information. So thank you. Um, we're gonna move to our next speaker. Um, next, we will hear from Dr. Alexander Shustari. Dr. Shustari is a medical oncologist who exclusively sees patients and people with melanoma. Within the global melanoma community, Dr. Shustari is best known for treating patients with acral, mucosal, and uveal melanomas. These less common types of melanoma arise in the eye or on hairless surfaces of the body and can often be more difficult to treat than more common skin melanomas. He works hard with our world-class surgeons, dermatologists, and radiation specialists to coordinate interdisciplinary team-based care that gets patients the best possible results. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Uh, I apologize. I realize you're reading bio for my, like my hospital. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, extra language there that I wouldn't, uh, I'm, I'm sort of blushing on. So thank you for, for that uh, kind intro. Um, I, uh, hopefully you can see the slide here. Um, looking forward, I think Dr. Khan uh, uh, really laid out uh, very nicely sort of where we've, what, at what point uh, we've come from and, and where we find ourselves today. Um, I know there's probably at least a couple of, of people who see me as, uh, as patients in my clinic and they say, oh, I'll see you Tuesday night. We'll see, you know, and uh, some of the, some of the folks have involved in, in some of the stuff I'll point out that is uh, active clinical trials. Um, I hope to kind of just in the next 15 minutes or so uh, cover things sort of broadly. Um, and I want to leave extra, you know, uh, plenty of time 
uh, for our patient advocates and uh, and questions, um, you know, that I, I'm sure I'll um, be happy to answer. So what are the clinical trial needs? I'll give you an, an example uh, in, you know, people who just have mucosal melanoma, as Dr. Khan mentioned, everyone's journey is different. And some people just have it in one spot. And we'll tell you what we're working on for, for those people. Um, and then for people that have a uh, spread or cannot have something removed, I think we'll, you know, we'll need uh, something uh, more there. Um, and so uh, I've chosen uh, cell therapy, uh, which is something I'm very uh, interested in um, in the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, giving you actually up to the day new information. I just checked if some of this data is public and it was published yesterday. So I just added it in there. So uh, trying to give you the most up-to-date overview. Um, I've been told this is recorded. So if you're interested in, you know, sort of which companies uh, I've worked with, it might influence the way that I talk about things like cell therapy, for example, um, mainly with a company called iAvance. They've provided funding to my institution. So we made progress, but uh, not as much as in cutaneous melanoma, as Dr. Khan uh, mentioned. Um, my goal as a physician and Dr. Khan's goal as a physician involved in clinical trials, and if some patients like yourselves that uh, try to spend their time in the evening, their, their precious free time, uh, you know, looking at this type of information, I think we need to band together and sort of point out that there are differences. There are some shared features and really push for uh, clinical trials that will advance clinical care. I think sometimes uh, oncologists are, um, you know, they're busy, they know that melanoma has made some advances, and they kind of, you know, paint every melanoma with the same brush and say, oh, immunotherapy is immunotherapy, or, you know, I've got a melanoma surgeon, it's my melanoma surgeon. And I think for mucosal in particular, we need to really be thoughtful. I'm sorry that I flashed that. I said I would warn people. Uh, so there is a, a nasal tumor uh, on the next slide. So so-called localized uh, disease can be very, very troublesome, right? Um, I think, you know, this is something that only spread later on in this, in this person inside the nose in, in this sort of you know, area there, but you would never call that just in one spot. That's just as troublesome as anything that spreads elsewhere. And so, you know, how we treat that, uh, that person is, it has to be different than how we do it in, in skin melanoma. And so far, we really haven't been able to, in the US at least, show how different it is. Um, the only you know, organized large prospective data for using the uh, standard uh, uh, PD-1 blocking immunotherapy only had 29 people. Uh, the skin melanoma has, you know, shown a clear benefit to one side of the uh, of the upright here, uh, showing that, you know, nivolumab is better than ipilimumab. If it were pembrolizumab, it would be the, probably the same thing on this side. And it's a nice tight line, nice tight line. For mucosal, there, there weren't that many people there. And so the line is very broad. And, and if you, you know, really think about it, we haven't really been able to, to show uh, definitively the way we would want to what modern immunotherapy can do. Um, and as Dr. Khan mentioned, a lot of uh, the important cool research has been coming uh, out of China. They have a very centralized approach to treating uh, a large proportion of their patients in, in Beijing. And uh, as he mentioned, it's a little bit more common there if you get melanoma to get mucosal. So they showed that, you know, chemotherapy uh, was better than an older immunotherapy that we don't really use here in the U.S. very much and better than just uh, watchful waiting. Um, so the gold was better than the black. But we and others showed that if you look at, this is just to give you a colorful scheme to impress you that on the right is a U.S. based melanoma uh, 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 folks. And then on the left is uh, some of the folks from China. And all I want you to look at is just how different the colors kind of look. So the patterns of mutation uh, are, are sort of different. Um, the green and red look different from right to left. And then the red and blue uh, there are a lot more sort of uh, red uh, bars uh, here in uh, in the U.S. population. That just sort of means 
their immune uh, environment of the tumor is sort of different. And so there's some geographic and ethnic differences. So one of the main unanswered questions for us in preventative therapy, that's what we call adjuvant therapy, um, is, you know, uh, the stuff that Dr. Khan mentioned about staging. We don't really even know exactly, you know, how many millimeters makes uh, someone higher risk or lower risk. And the first treatment uh, in China, they often outside of a trial will use chemotherapy. We don't see as much benefit to chemotherapy in the U.S. Uh, for stage four people. So we've been focused on using nivolumab or pembrolizumab, the two FDA approved treatments for skin melanoma. So can we actually improve on that? Can we use what we use anyway? Um, Cause we all are often using it in mucosal melanoma. Can we study it and, and try to even improve on it? And so there's this trial that I worked really hard on. So I had to include it. It took literally seven years to jump through multiple hurdles uh, I think I've tortured Dr. Khan maybe with this story. If I haven't, the next time I see you at a meeting, Dr. Khan, I'll, I'll bore you with why it took seven years. Dr. Carvajal, uh, who I know you know well, was part of that story. Um, but we're trying to sort of, you know, prove that one is better than the other with a placebo of a drug called cabazanib, which is very similar to the exitinib that Dr. Khan mentioned uh, in the Chinese study had shown some benefit when you combine it with the standard one immunotherapy drug. So uh, there's a group for, for people also that don't, uh, that didn't have a successful full removal. Um, but if you look the sort of green versus the blue, we're, we're using either, you know, the nivolumab by itself or uh, nivolumab with the cabazandum. And we hope to, to, to figure out, you know, whether adding that in is helpful. And even if it isn't helpful, that's, that's something good to know. That's, that's solid data. That you can, uh, you know, have a better discussion with someone in the clinic. So um, I'll jump next to, you know, how do we treat someone who isn't as fortunate to have it just in one spot? This is, you know, a CAT scan of a patient of mine with a lighter grayish things representing tumors in the liver. So this is someone that obviously can't benefit from surgery alone. Um, and, and Dr. Khan mentioned uh, the ways that we treat it uh, at present. Um, so I won't belabor the point. I think for um, time purposes, this is the same, I think, uh, data that, that we just showed you showing, you know, that the uh, blood vessel blocking drug X, um, you know, looked pretty good in a phase one study in China. So uh, we know that in skin melanomas as well, uh, another uh, blood vessel blocking drug, uh, Levatinib, has had some uh, effectiveness if the standard immunotherapy uh, didn't work. So I'm not uh, that clever of a person. I said, okay, it worked in China. It's worked in skin melanoma. Can we just show that it works in a more ethnically and, and, and racially a geographically distinct population uh, from the uh, Chinese population. And just in general, how can we, you know, give people options after standard immunotherapy doesn't work. And so we came up with um, our, our own institutional trial. It's still open. I'm sort of, I call it the two shots on goal uh, trial because uh, I like sports. Um, and the reason it's called two shots on goal when I sort of refer to it is at first, we're trying to just repeat the effectiveness of the, the data from China uh, that was uh, encouraging. And um, instead of toripalumab, we use nivolumab just because nivolumab is FDA approved here. Toripalumab is not. They're otherwise the same. So we're kind of rehashing that and hoping that we can prove that it, it, it causes the same type of shrinkages that, um, that they had shown. Um, then the uh, second part is the second shot on goal is if that doesn't work, as long as you tolerate it okay and don't have awful side effects um, to immunotherapy or the exitinib, um, we can choose whether to add in radiation uh, to just one or two or three spots, or if you have um, you know uh, a lot of uh, spread, uh, we add in the standard sort of second drug that you've heard about already and, and many of you already are aware of, ipilimumab, to the triplet. And so I think um, we're trying to show uh, that that's safe because one of the big issues 
is convincing drug company that this rare subtype of melanoma that needs help is sort of worth investing in. And, um, and uh, there's a lot of need, but one of the barriers is, well, boy, I'm not just going to start adding in a bunch of drugs together for a rare uh, cancer. Do you have any evidence at all that this will work? And so what we're trying to do is just to say for 10 to 20 people, is this doable? And if I, you know, if I have a person that benefits from a triplet, um, that's money in the bank for us to then go back to them and say, boy, wouldn't you like to get full FDA approval with a big study? And, you know, can we convince you to, to put a lot more money and effort in? Because I believe that the physician will is there. I think the patient will is there. Um, we just have to sort of lay the groundwork with these very small exploratory studies. So um, we're over halfway there um, and uh, we're already at the point where we know we're going to make it to all 20 uh, people. And anyway, so that's one major thing we're sort of working hard on. I think the other notable trial um, is this a uh, different way to stimulate the immune system. Um, it's a drug called Nemvalukin that's given intravenously um, five days in a row and then uh, repeating every 21 days, um, except for this first cycle is a little shorter. Um, so it's it's kind of a, you know, uh, a time intensive uh, drug uh, to, to receive as a person. It, you have to sit there for a while, five days in a row is kind of annoying. But what's nice about it is they had a little bit of effectiveness in their phase one study of all melanomas. And to their credit, um, the the um, company um, you know said, you know what, we're kind of all in on this. We're going to try to show whether or not our drug can work just in mucosal melanoma. And it's not that many things around that are trying to show that, especially in the group that is resistant to standard immunotherapy. Um, they are very picky about who they allow in. It has to be the second or the third drug. It can't be the fourth or the fifth. And uh, you can't have only gotten one dose or something. You have to have gotten like 12 weeks or more, which is sometimes a struggle if someone's disease is growing quickly. But to, to I think, everyone's credit, it's a worldwide effort. We're expecting results next year. I know um, Dr. Khan's been involved in this study is uh, sort of familiar with this. And uh, many of us are sort of really, uh, you know, got our fingers crossed that uh, in the near future, that drug, um, not as near as we would like, it always takes longer than you think, but in the near future, this drug may be in our uh, arsenal. Uh, there are a couple of other um, uh, trials. There's one from University of Colorado that I'm, I'm eager to hear about results at some point. There's no results as far as I know yet. Um, and, uh, and then, I'm going to spend the last bit, hopefully we have a couple minutes, yes, to talk about sort of broad melanoma cell therapy trials that that are including some mucosal melanoma. So um, cell-based therapy is something I'm, I'm interested in um, on a personal level. So uh, just to summarize, it's a newer type of immunotherapy um, that can work, but it's harsher and kind of harder than your standard immunotherapy. So I want to be very upfront about that. And I stole this from uh, the company uh, has a schematic um, where they sort of say, hey, you know, you have to go through surgery. Um, they make the drug. You get chemo in the, usually in the hospital, um, receive the cells in the hospital and then get an immune stimulant called IL-2. Um, and then you recover from that big, big wallop and hope that the engineered, you know, your immune cells that have been sent to sort of uh, ninja school to learn how to kick some butt, uh, come back and just start kicking uh, tumor butt. And so sometimes it can be a giant um, process, but uh, be effective in shrinking your melanoma in the long run. And so I'll skip past this slide. Um, it just shows how they make it. Um, just to show you that in the skin melanoma trial um, published now a couple of years ago, uh, the original phase two, each, you know, bar is a patient and we, we, uh, patients, uh, uh, sorry, tumor shrinkage or growth. And we like to see things below the, uh, horizon. Um, and, uh, so that looks pretty good. Um, in this plot, um, there were 24 people that had shrinkage. Again, this is all melanomas, not just mucosal, um, Every time it drops, it's a it's a heartbreaking sort of growth after initial shrinkage. Um, 
And so here you can see not everybody had growth, but a decent number unfortunately did. Um, so if there's some shrinkage initially, it doesn't guarantee that you'll be successful, but hey, it's better than nothing. Um, and for some people, it's much, much better than nothing. Um, so in, uh, I'll skip past this one. Does it work for mucosal melanoma? So this is what was published yesterday online. Um, and so I can share with you, I wasn't involved in the phase two study originally, but we'd always been asking them, how many people with mucosal were in that phase two? Cause they didn't break it down. And then we said, how many of them have gotten shrinkage? We knew from anecdotal experience uh, with later studies that it could work, but they're going to present out of those first, like um, out of that first group of, uh, I don't know, hundred something patients, uh, 12 had mucosal melanoma, six had shrinkage. That's more than I expect. I, I don't expect that to be that successful in the real world. I think that's important to sort of say um, up front. I think phase two studies always enroll kind of healthier people than the average person. Um, but I think that's enough to, for us all to say um, that when we all really hope the FDA agrees that this is effective and safe for, for broader melanoma use, non-ocular melanoma use, basically, uh, everything except uveal melanoma will be included in that, I think. Um, I think we will all be excited to use it. However, it's time consuming, it's demanding, it's it's effortful, and it's certainly risky. Um, the you know, there are people who die from infections or bleeding complications um, and other things along the way in a lengthy hospital stay. I don't expect 50% effectiveness. It will be lower than that, six out of twelve doesn't actually mean 50% in real life. Um, but I think, and what I tell my, my, uh, the patients that I see is, you know, we are accelerating our pace. You know, I hope I've shown that to you in, in the, in the 20 minutes that I've been uh, talking. Um, and cell therapy is just one of several, um, places, uh, where, uh, things are coming. It's just never coming fast enough, of course. And so we're working hard uh, I appreciate your time. I think I have a summary slide that I can just sort of leave up for you guys to pause and look at later. Um, I think we all need to work together, continue to advocate online and at meetings, um, at these sort of events uh, to sort of collaborate uh, and uh, and do more clinical trials. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shustari, for sharing about clinical trials and the research and the exciting um, new things that are that are coming along. And thanks for all your work in this space. Um, we are going to move to our patient advocate, Mary Harper. Uh, Mary Harper's professional accomplishments include professor in electrical and computer engineering at Purdue University, Program Director at National Science Foundation, Research Scientist at the Center of the Advanced Study of Languages at University of Maryland, Area Director at the Johns Hopkins U Human Language Technology Center of Excellence, Program Manager at IARPA, and Deputy Chief, Deputy Chief Scientist at Army Research Laboratory. She received her PhD in Computer Science from Brown University, where her focus was on artificial intelligence. Her experience with academics, research, and program management provides a basis for her advocacy for future cancer research. Mary was diagnosed with nasal mucosal melanoma in April 2021 and has since embraced learning about the state of the art with an eye toward future advances from the literature, the Mucosal Melanoma Warriors Facebook group, and groups such as the Melanoma Research Foundation. We are so grateful and appreciative that you are with us today, Mary. Thank you, Miriam. Oh my gosh, your slides. Can you see them okay? Uh, I cannot. Oh, there they are. Okay, um, I just wanted to put up, this is my mucosal melanoma journey. And my email is there if any patient wants to reach out to me, they've got specific questions or just want to, uh, talk to somebody about what they're going through, I'm happy to uh, help. So next slide. So <clears throat> I have been through two cycles of, of treatment. My first cycle, 
Well, I had a bloody nose from hell in 2018 in December um, that they had the hardest time stopping and they couldn't really make it stop. And then I had to go and have a cauterization with an ENT. At the time they saw nothing. But then I had another nosebleed pop up in March of 2021, which was just as heavy. I was doing yoga and all of a sudden I started getting, and the ENT cauterized it. It was the same one. And he says, oh, there's a polyp there. We should take it out. But he says, I don't think it's cancer. He says, it doesn't look like cancer to me. So a few weeks later, he did a polypectomy. And I got my results back April Fool's Day, 2021, and it was malignant mucosal melanoma. Um, then all hell breaks loose because you're you're staging and digging deeper. So I had uh, PET CT, and I had to get a lung biopsy because that came back with there was something in my lung, but there was not. It was not cancer. It was a a bacteria. And my staging ended up being stage three. Um, I also had at that time foundation genetic testing, which had a low mutation rate and nothing, none of those common mutations for, for cutaneous or mucosal melanoma. So I, I went and got two different opinions. One was surgery, radiation, and maybe adjuvant Keytruda. The other one, proposed that I do a neoadjuvant ipilimumab, nivolumab, um, followed by margin surgery, then get the three adjuvant doses, followed by a year of nevo. Well, <laughs> what happens? Well, I had the one dose of ipinevo neoadjuvantly. That's before the surgery. And then I had the margin surgery done. And at the time, they came, the pathology report came back they found no mucosal melanoma at all, none. Then I managed two more doses of ipinevo adjuvantly. Then the colitis began. So I had side effects and I had to do several courses of steroids. Then I came back, had to do more courses of steroids. And from that point on, they said, yeah, maybe we're not going to treat you with any more immunotherapy. Let's just be vigilant, right? And so you know, quarterly PET CTs, endoscopic exams of the nose quarterly to monitor the spread. And there was no detectable melanoma. So they said the radiation and EVO are not prescribed. The other thing that I did was I, I tried to be as healthy in my lifestyle as possible. I did lots of exercise daily, made sure there was good fiber in my diet, whole foods, and all of that. Next slide. So the, se the second cycle began uh, when I went for my endoscopy exam and there was a little tiny spot. And my otolaryngologist went in and did a punch biopsy. It was just inflamed. Now, the thing you should know about my mucosal melanoma is it's amelanotic. So it doesn't look like melanoma, right? So it, she went in and did a punch biopsy she called me three days later, got preliminary results. It's back. So I went and got my uh, my oncologist at the time wanted to do neoadjuvant abdulog surgery, followed by 10 do doses of adjuvant abdulog. Um, there was a second opinion that just said surgery and surgery and radiation. Well, I went with the Abdulog. Uh, by the time I had two doses of Abdulog, it was gone, just gone. The ENT, the, the otolaryngologist could not find it. It was no detectable melanoma. So I continued with the Abdulog, one more dose. Then I got pancreatitis and colitis. So I got side effects, put back on steroids. I'm finally weaned down. So we're going with PET CTs quarterly, endoscopic exams quarterly, and circulating DNA testing. And so far, that's all been zero, which is really lovely. And of course, healthy lifestyle, exercise, fiber, and whole food. So next slide. So 
what did I learn along the path? Well, I, I think it's important. The more you know, you're going to be helping, you're going to be working with your doctors to make decisions about what to try, right? So um, one of the places where I got a lot of support and help was the Mucosal Melanoma Warriors Group. And there's um, a link there that you can get to. I also like to look at the research and, and how it might impact current and future decisions. I like to have some notion of a plan B because you know, you're being vigilant. You want to catch it as soon as possible. I have no metastasis at all. My, my recurrence was local and it was very tiny when, when it was first found. But if I had spread, I really want to make sure that I had something lined up that would help me to treat my cancer uh, together with my oncology team. Uh, I like to look at trials and understand the qualifiers and disqualifiers. There are a lot of disqualifiers and sometimes mucosal melanoma is a disqualifier. I have really enjoyed attending workshops and research meetings. Um, the Melanoma Research Foundation has a wonderful research uh, uh, meeting every year that's really lovely. I got to attend the scientific meeting last, last year and really enjoyed it. Uh, the other thing that I've been embracing is helping the research community better understand because so I contribute, I contributed to the rare registry. This is a registry where you can register the information about your mucosal melanoma. And I also am volunteering as a patient advocate and also have uh, signed up to review research grant applications. So next. Next. Next slide. So um, example melanoma resources. If you go to the Melanoma Research Alliance page, you can see across the top of the, the page that there's a lot of resources. There's stuff for patients, and under there, there's some information about trials. But there's also information on research. There's news. They have an annual report that you can read. It's all fascinating stuff. And it really makes me feel that there's people out there working for me and helps me to maintain a sort of an optimistic outlook. So um, that's one example. They're all over the, the web. Next. Um, the mucosal melanoma warriors, um, we have put together uh, four pages on getting started with mucosal melanoma. If you go and sign up for the Mucosal Melanoma Warriors group under files, like a little circle there, um, you can pull up getting started with Mucosal Melanoma. And there's a lot of resources, including on things like the TIL treatment that Dr. Shastari talked about. Next. And last but not least, the Rare Registry, which is also uh, supported. Uh, it's a registry for patients with acral and mucosal melanoma. Next. And it's a free web-based tool for people to sign up. I think it's limited to uh, people in the U.S., but to learn more, you can go to raremelanoma.org and you can actually sign up and then go in and put your information in. It's really uh, a good thing to do. I have to go in and update it with my recurrence, because as soon as the recurrence happened, it was like, I got to focus on getting better. But I'm doing well. And uh, next, I think that might be it. So that's it for me. Um, I think I benefited a lot from the fact that cutaneous was doing things that people weren't doing with mucosal melanoma. And so I had the benefit of having neoadjuvant immunotherapy that had me essentially having no evidence of disease for about two years before I had my small recurrence. And as soon as I had neoadjuvant again, I didn't have to have surgery. So um, sure, I had side effects, but I'm doing well. So anyway, if you have questions, please, please feel free to ask me or send me an email later. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Mary, for sharing your story with us and some wonderful resources. I know we are coming up on time and we have some great questions in the chat, so I want to get to them. Um, and just a fair warning that we 
Uh, we'll, we'll try to not go too long after eight um, Eastern time, but uh, I wanna get to your wonderful questions. Um, so anyone can answer. Um, greetings from Barcelona, Spain. My brother had rectal mucosal melanoma one year ago. He has not had surgery and receiving nivolumab immunotherapy. They also did full brain radiation. For his multiple brain metastases, he continues only with nivolumab. Can we do something else? Still stable after one year. Seems like a pretty specific question, um, but any general thoughts? Um, yeah, I guess I, I can I, I can weigh in. You know, I, uh, I'm sorry. You know, your your family is going through that, and um, you, you know, so um, you know, metastases to the brain. Uh, unfortunately, they they do typically exclude um, people. You know, Mary was talking about exclusions from clinical trials. Um, although if they've been fully treated and are stable, sometimes um, trials do allow patients to still come on. Um, having said that, I also am not totally familiar with what the kind of trial landscape is in Europe and Spain. Um, uh, but certainly, you know, uh, a clinical trial like some of the ones that Dr. Shastari described would be reasonable here. If that's not an option, then, um, you know, I think many of us would probably try a combination immunotherapy approach here. Um, uh, and um, in, in the hopes that um, there might be some additional benefit to the nivolumab alone. Um, you know, Mary mentioned Abdulag, which um, we didn't really talk about because there's really no data in mucosal melanoma, but that is an approved regimen in, in skin melanoma um, and something that we um, will use sometimes as an alternative to ipilimumab and nivolumab or sometimes even after um, uh, if there's not another option. So I think, you know, uh, it's, it's difficult, obviously, to comment specifically, but that might be one approach. And then um, you know, as we mentioned, chemotherapy, you know, there, there is strong data for it. Again, again, you know, limited um, potentially by, by ethnic differences, but um, that would be a potential alternative that could also be available outside of clinical trials. Alex, I don't know if there, you had any other thoughts. Just one, I want to make sure we get to other questions too, but just one also thing to say, if, if you're stable one year in with active, you know, brain meths when, when things started, something's got to be going right, you know? So I wouldn't necessarily say you have to eliminate all traces of something uh, on your scans to be successful. And stability can be a very good thing in this situation. Dr. Khan, because you brought up um, different backgrounds, can, considering um, the di diverse ethnical background in US patients, can Chinese American patients follow the treatment option practice in China? That's a great question. I, Alex, I might defer this to you also because you've done some work looking at the specific genetic differences, but you know, I, I don't I don't think that it would be un, unreasonable, right? I mean, especially if we're talking about somebody who um, you know, Im immigrated or is first generation, um, you know, I think it, genetically, and there's a lot we don't know, but um, you know, there probably are significant commonalities. And so if there is indeed a difference based on those things, which we're not sure of, but if the, if that is um, then I think it, it would be reasonable. Although um, I think, you know, we still think that, um, you know, immunotherapy or combination immunotherapy or other investigational approaches are also quite promising. Yeah, I think there's, you know, one big emerging factor that we haven't had time to touch on is this idea that you are what you eat. Uh, 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 Mary definitely has, you know, alluded to that throughout saying, you know, I'm trying to eat high fiber, et cetera. Um, I think there might be something about not just the genetics, but also these other non-genetically inherited, sorry, that's my New York City apartment uh, pizza delivery. So uh, ignore the sounds of uh, of what it's like to live in a one bedroom uh, apartment in New York City. So um, I, I would say that, yes, I, I do often extrapolate from the Chinese data for a Chinese American. I think if they're sort of first or second generation though, and they've been eating US food and living here for a while, I, I do wonder, are the, you know, is it more like 
things look a little more immunotherapy sensitive on this side of, of the Pacific, and it looks a little more chemo sensitive on that side of the Pacific. And, and to be honest, no one really knows because we need a big global trial uh, that hasn't happened yet and probably will not happen for quite a while. Um, so I'm kind of playing both sides here, but uh, I would say it's it's definitely reasonable to, to think about it, especially for um, an East Asian immigrant. Very fascinating. Thank you. And while I have you, um, we have a question if you will be attending the MRF NYC gala next week. You know, I, um, I'm going to the European conference and then I think I'm just kind of swamped. So I, I, um, I may not be there. <laughs> um, but sorry to uh, put you on the spot, but people yeah. are asking. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I, I think I had said no, actually, because I'm assuming I'll be uh, extraordinarily uh, jet lagged. I usually get a cold after I've been traveling. Understandable. Thank you. Um, in recurring vulva um, mucosal melanoma, would immunotherapy help to prevent recurrence? I, I guess I can touch on that. So, you know, again, we don't we don't know. Um, you know, that's part of what we need to study further. Um, and, um, you know, uh, you know, to that end, you know, Dr. Shastari's trial through the Alliance Cooperative Group is looking at a version of that. Um, uh, you know, we extrapolate from skin melanoma, um, and uh, when we extrapolate from skin melanoma in the, in the advanced or metastatic setting, we see that, although not quite as effective, there is significant activity for immunotherapy, and so you know, if we were to make the same leap in the in in the adjuvant setting, or are in a situation where a recurrent melanoma has been able to be removed surgically, um, perhaps there there is benefit there. But you know, we can't say that for sure. Um, and so, um, you know, I think depending on who you talk to, um, you might receive different answers. Um, it certainly wouldn't be unreasonable um, to try. Um, but um, I think, as, as Dr. Shastari mentioned before, if there is a possibility of you um, um, enrolling on a clinical trial, I think that would be, um, you know, our recommendation. I'd be also interested to hear um, Mary's perspective uh, discussing with her physicians, clearly very informed and sort of thoughtful in their choice. What I will say is, uh, I'm sure Dr. Khan, you agree, we are increasingly trying to treat a recurrence that comes nearby as a failure, like a total body failure, uh, and using medications like, you know, pick your immunotherapy, but, but using that so-called neoadjuvant, meaning I could remove it, but it's a total body risk. And so why don't we approach it that way? And I think that's uh, certainly been our practice and, and I'm sure Dr. Khan, your practice for quite a while. Um, Mary, I'm interested in, cause I, well, as far as I know, you're, you're not being treated with me certainly, but, um, no. with Dr. Khan. So it's, it's someone else totally entirely. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at the Shar Cancer Institute, in Northern Virginia. So that's where I'm being treated. And I, I, I've had the benefit. I mean, my daughter's a physician, so she's been there all along. She's reached out to her network. So I think I think I've had the benefit of more input than even the multiple the multiple um, inputs that I had every time something happened. But you want to reach out and and decide on things. Well, my current my current oncology team is not real keen on doing radiation, right? Which is sort of standard of care or was standard of care as I was beginning. And I think the neoadjuvant made sense to me because neoadjuvant was working pretty well, chemotherapy for breast cancer. So you start hearing neoadjuvant, yeah, let's fight it at the system level. And it it did hold it back. I, I probably don't have the best immune system on aging, right? But uh, immunotherapy seems to basically zoop, knocks it out. It was really quite amazing to... I, I mean, they they removed my right middle turbinate, the full thing, and there was no sign in, in, in the initial stage, in the initial um, uh, surgery, you know, the, the margin surgery of any melanoma at all, which was really quite surprising. 
So systemically, there's something there. It's not showing up in terms of ctDNA. It's not showing up now in terms of the endoscopy. Never showed up in PET CTs. My PET CTs have been clear except for the first one that showed something on the lung. I had a biopsy. It was uh, just a slow grow slow growing bacteria that went away. So, you know, they've all been clear. So I I don't know. It's been I, I'm 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 lucky, but unlucky. You know, it's hard to have mucosal melanoma, but it's really nice to know that the immunotherapy works so well for me that, uh, you know, but mm -hmm. I always, it's always nice to know that we've got other options. So I'm really keen to know more about, you know, the combination with the chemotherapy and the combinations that you're doing. Um, it's very, very, very interesting. Um, I want to ask a question if that's okay, because I, I put, I, I, the only place I could put it was in chat. Um, the staging that happens by, by site is so different. And I think sometimes our vulva, vulva um, mucosal melanoma patients don't do as well because they end up getting less treatment, just, just surgery. They're told they have melanoma in situ. How can mucosal melanoma be in situ ever, even if it's on the surface of the vulva? vulva um, it, I, I do think that sometimes they are treated less aggressively and perhaps less effectively. And that, that kind of bothers me a little bit. I've been seeing seeing things happen in our group that, that, that make me have some pause. Yeah, I, um, I think that goes with sort of increasing understanding and, and not trying to paint with a broad brush. I think even at my own institution, uh, you know, a surgical residence or something will, you know, put in their note, um, you know, say, oh, vulvar melanoma. And I say, well, that's actually on the hairless part near the clitoris. And, you know, that, uh, you know, seems to be, I think, uh, you know, a little riskier and, and uh, there isn't always sometimes a, a, a focus on, um what the global risks are when you when you have uh, a local problem, quote unquote. Um, I think it's scary. It's overwhelming. There's a lot of things to juggle and you just want it out and you want to be done with it. Um, and so I don't blame anyone for doing less in that situation when we just told you for 40 minutes that there's gaps in our knowledge. And so it's reasonable not to do additional things. But uh, I think at many institutions that have the expertise, there'll generally be a, a multidisciplinary discussion, you know, a surgeon, a medical person, a radiation person. And even if they just kind of wave to you, you were waiting for two hours to see them. It was a 10 minute conversation. It feels like a, a waste sometimes, but I, I don't think it is because at least you've got people who have skin in the game now, and now you can have them all talk to each other and, and come up with the plan. I, I, yeah. The multidisciplinary um, team is very important. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I had radi I had a radiologist, I had nodolaryngologist, and I had my, yeah, it, I think it's very important to have all those people at the table. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Um, I am going to cut off the questions now, but please, if anyone has any additional questions, please reach out to me at education at melanoma.org. Some questions were a little bit more specific, so I do encourage you to go back to your care team and ask them these important questions. And um, tonight, as um, I just wanna thank all of our speakers for tonight and for presenting during this Ask the Expert webinar session. Um, we appreciate all that you do for the melanoma community and appreciate you taking the extra time out of your busy schedules this evening to join us. Um, thank you again to Alchemies for their generous support of our Ask the Expert webinar series. Um, again, this program will be available on our on-demand platform for you to watch after tonight's session. And it all will also be streamed on our social media channels at a later day. So please be sure to follow us. Um, at the end of the session, when you click leave, when you click exit, 
a evaluation will pop up on your screen. Please do fill that out and provide us with feedback um, on today's session. That's so important to us as we plan for future educational sessions to provide to you, our patients and our community. Um, with that, please remember to visit us at melanoma.org to learn more about our webinars and upcoming other educational um, uh, opportunities. And if you have any questions for me, you can reach me at education at melanoma.org. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Take care. <laughs>